We've just been looking at what happens at the end of a red giant phase if the stellar remnant has a mass less than the Chandrasekhar limit, which is uh, 1.4 solar masses. Um, now this one right here, uh, this is what happens with uh, things that are sort of medium mass, something like our own sun. And of course we learned that it becomes a red giant, then it becomes a planetary nebula, and then it cools to become a white dwarf, which eventually just dies out. But what happens if it has a mass greater than 1.4 solar masses? Okay, so this here is what happens. Again, remember, this is the Chandrasekhar limit. So if it has a mass greater than this, then something kind of interesting happens. I mean, it, it goes from red giant phase, like we talked about before. And what does it do then? Well, this is actually kind of interesting. Uh, maybe we'll actually write it down over here first. So the Chandrasekhar limit. Well, what happens is this. The, we can say that the core collapses. Because remember, it's, it's trying to fuse iron, and it can't. So the core collapses. Again, that's because we have this, um, we have this, this idea that um, it can't fuse anything higher than iron. Right, so the, the core itself has iron in it, and it's got other elements, of course, going on out there, but it can't fuse iron. So what happens then is uh, this hydrostatic equilibrium is no longer the case, which means it doesn't have enough outwards pressure, so gravity sort of wins and the core still collapses. But what happens is the core collapses, but it can't be packed any tighter. So just like before, or just like in the mass less than 1.4 solar masses, um, but it can't be packed any denser. So, so far, this is nothing uh, new to the other one. But what happens this, though, is that it has enough mass. See, because, because this thing has so much mass, this collapse is very violent. In the case of something with a mass less than 1.4 solar masses, I mean, the core collapses, it's true, but um, of course it bounces off and it gives off, you know, some of this, uh, some of these layers of gas here are sort of emitted in a planetary nebula, but that was about it. But over here, in this case, it has enough mass to where this core collapse is so violent, and because it can't be packed any denser, then what happens is um, the material bounces out. This is actually what happens in a supernova explosion. The material bounces out, so it's not like the star actually explodes in a, in that sense. What really happens is the core, um, sorry, the rest of the star collapses so fast, but then it reaches this core that's sort of it's sort of so hard. It's like everything goes boing and bounces off and goes out again. So the material bounces out, and of course that. That happens very quickly. So I'll say but material bounces out very quickly. I mean like fraction of a second. Very quickly and violently. And of course this is what we call the supernova. In other words, that is a big explosion. So that's really what happens is that this material is actually being bounced off of it. So what really happens then, maybe I'll move this a little bit down just in order to make it easier to see. There we go. So we have our red giant. Of course, what does it do? It makes a supernova explosion, right? Because the material bounces out, so it goes flying outwards. So supernova explosion, there it goes. It sends out all sorts of stuff out, right? It sort of blows up in a big giant supernova, which we can see hopefully, and it's very bright and it looks really cool to astronomers. Although it rarely actually is visible uh, to the naked eye, but there have been a few examples of ones that were. Now what happens during the supernova, this is what's really interesting, I think. Um, during the, now normally we call a supernova, for short we call SN. So during the SN, it makes the elements uh, higher than iron. So this is when it's doing it. So in other words, um, when you have any elements in you, which you have lots of things that are higher than iron, those things we think were only made or just about only made in a supernova explosion. So only in the explosion here were those things made. Of course, then those are sent out. 
So this supernova explosion, what happens afterwards? Well, then there's actually two sort of possible choices. There's two possible things that might happen. So it might make a neutron star. Now, the neutron star is actually, like we talked about before with this ledge, you know, this idea that everything wants to sort of collapse, but then it sort of has to stop somewhere. What's happening in this case right here, the thing that stops it is not electron degeneracy pressure, it's actually neutron degeneracy pressure. So I'm going to say stable due to neutron degeneracy pressure. So what's happening is these neutrons can't be packed any tighter. Again, it's another quantum mechanics thing. But basically, these neutrons cannot be packed any tighter. So they sort of they resist the collapse. So they sort of end up making this stable ledge. So that way, when the core all wants to sort of free fall, collapse inwards on itself, it basically the core sort of stops it. It goes boing, no more. So it sends everything else out, obviously, in the supernova. Or what's left over is just the neutrons here that are really, really highly packed. It's called a neutron star. Or if it's even more massive, we think it can make what's called a black hole. So those are the two sort of possible choices of sort of what we think the remainder or the remnant will be after a very high mass star. So a high mass star that's stellar remnant. In other words, when it's done its red giant phase, if it has a mass higher than the chandra sekhar limit, which is 1.4 solar masses, then we think that it will make a supernova explosion. And that will end up with the result of either a neutron star, or if it's even more massive, it makes a black hole. So what I'd like to do now is just show you a few uh, different little things here. So the, the next thing I'd like to show you is just something about um, the evolution of a high mass star. So before we were looking at the low mass stars, how they went sort of up and sort of went like this. High mass stars, they make it look a lot more sort of horizontal like this. This is this is right here is what happens when it runs out of hydrogen. It's going to go this way right here until it basically has its helium flash and it starts burning helium. And of course, then it's going to go back and forth and back and forth as it does more and more layers. But at the end, it still ends up being a red giant, right? So they all seem to end up over here. At least most of them do. But then what happens over here? They blow up. Now what I want to show you again is uh, something about the lifetime. I think this is really important and really interesting is how long stars actually live. So there is a, uh, a neat thing here that the more massive stars, I will write this down here, so may more massive stars, those, um, they burn very quickly. So stars like over here, for example, they burn very quickly. And when I say they burn, I mean they sort of die out. They go through all their different stages very fast. I mean, their lifetime might be only a few million years. So only a few mega years. That could be its lifetime. Whereas um, something that's sort of a, a medium, uh, medium mass star. Whoops, I can't spell. Medium mass star that will have a lifetime of around um, oh, it could be something like uh, a few billion years in other words giga years so these are here these live some millions of years only which is very very short so only some millions of years these of course are billions of years And low mass stars, those are very, very slowly. Okay, so those burn very slowly. And so those can have lifetimes of, well, much, much more than that. So long, long lifetimes. How long? Uh, we estimate that actually some of them are still burning. In other words, they sort of go on, you know, pretty much practically infinity obviously not but you know as far as we're concerned billions and billions and billions and billions of years 
So what this tells us, if you can, you can actually see some of the data in this same HR diagram we keep looking at. They've actually got some information about uh, these. Look at these green things for the lifetime. So look at this right here. So these right here, that's the lifetime of these, 10 to the 7 years. That's tens of millions of years. This right here is, uh, we could have like 10 to the 9 years, 10 to the 10 years, 10 to the 11 years. So these are sort of billions and trillions of uh, of years. Well, these are actually, let's see, billions would be 10 to the 9. Uh, these would be hundreds of billions of years. And we think the universe is only 13.7 billion years old. So if it lasts sort of hundreds of billions of years, maybe I should define that. So it's actually hundreds of billions of years. Um, in that sense, these stars are here pretty much of, you know, once they sort of start burning, they're pretty much always around, right? Because these ones here have lifetimes so much longer than the universe has even been around. You know, they're, they're essentially going to live forever. Our own sun, though, will only be, well, around, uh, around 10 or so, or tens of billions of years. That's it. Well, that's it. It seems pretty long. But uh, it's already a few billion years old, we think. So we'll have to see how long our own sun lasts. But I just wanted to show you at least that these mass versus lifetime is actually pretty important.